Hi, everyone. Welcome to Voices, a library lecture series. We'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that we are gathered on the sacred homelands of the Mahikinyak or Mohican people who are the stewards of this land. Today, the community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie Mohican Nation. We pay honor and respect to those Hi, past everyone. and present. Welcome to Voices, a library lecture series. We'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that we are gathered on the sacred Voices present speakers on timely and enduring issues each semester to broaden and enrich the scope of studies at Hudson Valley Community College. Please fill out a survey at the link on our slide to help inform our future programming. Please welcome today's panelists for education in the time of COVID. Thank you, Anne. Uh, we're pleased to be here. My name is Liz Yanoff, and I'm Chair of Education and Social Sciences at Hudson Valley. And today we're joined by Jeffrey Sims from East Greenbush and John Carmelo from Troy City School District. And I'm going to have them introduce themselves. So you are the leaders of you know, significantly large school districts in our area. Tell us about your district. Um, how did you come to be a school leader? And what skills do you think school leaders need to be effective? Jeff, why don't you start? Well, I'm Jeff Simons and I'm the superintendent here in East Greenbush, which is a district of about 4,000 students, K through 12. We have five elementary schools, a six through eight middle school. And we have Columbia High School, which serves approximately 1,200 students in grades nine through 12. Uh, I started my educational career as a first, second and third grade teacher, uh, teaching primarily at the elementary level. And then through staff and curriculum development experiences, I became a staff and curriculum developer and then was encouraged to become a principal. I was an elementary principal and then an assistant superintendent for curriculum instruction and then superintendent in both Rome City School District and the Mohawk Valley. And I've been here in East Greenbush as the superintendent. I'm in my fifth year. So, and I, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Elizabeth. As far as what skills you need to be a school leader during this time, I think uh, first and foremost, communication. Uh, it is uh, essential that you are able to communicate with the public regarding school district decision-making and also to be able to communicate effectively internally with everyone from your administrative team to your board of education, to your support staff and your teachers to make sure that everybody continues to uh, work in the same direction and towards the same vision and facilitating that communication, I would say among on a number of skills is really the primary responsibility of the superintendent is to ensure that communication is flowing outward to your constituencies and also inward to your constituencies. Thank you, John. Hi everybody, John Carmelo. I'm the superintendent here, right here in Troy, the Troy School District. Uh, we also have five elementary schools and one six to eight middle school and Troy High School. Uh, about 4,000 students, very similar in size to East Greenbush, but uh, the difference is in our demographics. We're a small city school. Uh, and so that um, brings with it some um, specific and, and uh, different challenges. Um, I taught for 10 years math, uh, mainly high school math, calculus, pre-calculus, those kind of things. Uh, like uh, my friend Jeff, a uh, friend and colleague, um, I was encouraged to then go into administration. I was a building administrator for about 10 years, teacher for 10, building administrator for 10, and this is my eighth year as superintendent, after two years as assistant superintendent. So really um, 10 years as teacher, 10 years in the building administration, and now 10 years as a district administrator. Um, I, Jeff uh, answered it pretty well with the communication. I would say also one of the important things about leading, uh, not just in a pandemic, but always is relationships. And so uh, we've had a very difficult past year, um, not just in education, but in the country and the world. And when things are tough and you need people to step up and you need people to start doing things differently and go above and beyond, you have to, um, you know, you rely on the relation, past relationships that you've been able to build to get people to do that. So um, we have a great staff here. We have a great school community uh, internally and the outside community. Uh, but all of that has been because of the relationships have, were good before this uh, pandemic started. Uh, I read one time it said, 
uh, what's the most important thing a leader needs or has to have. Uh, and, you know, people talk about relationships or communication or other skills that they might have, but the answer was followers. And so, you know, you can't be a good leader if people aren't going to be uh, excited and encouraged to follow you uh, where you are leading. And so, again, that goes back to relationships and in a, in a pandemic like we've been dealing with, um, you know, everybody has to be on the same page. And, and again, uh, it goes back to, to the things you've built up before the pandemic started. Thank you for that. So it's hard to believe, but we've passed one year um, since schools were affected by the pandemic. Um, John, why don't you start this time? Tell us what a day looks like for you know students in Troy a year later. How has school been shaped by the pandemic? Uh, it's been fundamentally changed. Um, actually, the year anniversary yeah was um, just this past week, and so I sent an email out to my staff on that one year anniversary. I sent a little message to the school community, just thanking everybody for all that they've done. Um, you know, last year at this time, we were still very uncertain about what the future held. We thought we were closing for a couple of weeks and then weeks turned into months and months turned into, you know, this school year and now a year later and we're still at it. Um, last spring, because we had to change and adapt so quickly, um, it really was done on the fly. And so we had March, April, May, June where we did the best we can, we could, and we had a lot of great things happen. But this school year, after a month or a summer of planning, uh, really, really proud of what's going on. So your question is, what does it look like? So our students, K through five, are here in person every day if they choose to be. Our students in six through 12, that's the middle school and high school, are here two days and then remote two and then here two. Again, if they choose to be, we still have about 33% of our district students that are choosing to be full remote for a variety of reasons, um, but we're um, happy to accommodate that as well. So uh, the day is similar in a sense that, you know, it starts the same time it always started and you have classes all day long and you're with a teacher all day long. Um, but for, again, 33%, they're doing that like we're doing this right now, uh, virtually over, we use Google Meets mainly in our district. Um, and then the kids that are there are in person, but sharing the attention of the teacher with students who are also home. So for a teacher, it's been really so difficult to navigate the technology and to deal with six or seven or up to 14 or 15 kids in front of you and have sometimes that same number of kids uh, home on the screen like, like we're doing right now. So uh, our teachers have really stepped up. Um, and, and again, the difference between last spring and now is, is night and day and, and uh, really proud of uh, how much everybody's learned and the technology that we're able to do. Um, during this time. Thank you, Jeff. Well, I would say that our, our experience is similar to what John described in Troy, that we've moved from last spring and having to respond immediately to circumstances that we weren't sure uh, where this was going to lead to establishing procedures and routines that try to be as responsive as possible to the needs of the children and the families. We're currently in a hybrid K through 12, but as COVID rates have shifted in the region, we've been trying to be as responsive as possible to bringing more children in for in-person learning, making adjustments to our program. For example, we have our first graders and our second graders coming back five days a week uh, within the next couple of weeks, we've responded to various children that we knew were struggling with remote learning by bringing them in for more in-person instruction. That's at all levels, elementary, middle school, and high school. So I think the day is best defined by how can we be as responsive as possible to changing needs and changing circumstances, and whether those changes be uh, needs that are brought to our attention from families 
or from teachers or from circumstances. I mean, in, in many ways, superintendents wake up every day and check to see what is the latest uh, mandate uh, coming from the state? Uh, how are we to interpret that mandate and how can we respond in ways that make sure that we are taking care of children, taking care of family considerations and supporting our staff, which, which has been proven to be uh, very adaptable, flexible and responsive to students. Our teachers and our support staff have done a remarkable job at uh, moving in different directions based on the circumstances of the COVID-19 infection rate and being able to respond remarkably to a level of differentiation really and a level of responsiveness to individual and family needs that perhaps is one of the good things that will come out of this is that our teachers have shown that they're adaptable and that they can respond to changing student needs. And I really think that's something that we're, we're gonna carry with us after the pandemic not only in terms of how they use technology, but their, their willingness to, to adapt instruction to individual circumstances. Yes, and that actually you know, leads me to my next question. But before I ask that, I will say that those of you listening, um, I have some questions prepared, but please do share questions and they'll be relayed to us through the live stream. But um, Dr. Gladys Cruz of Quest R3 BOCES, I recently heard her speaking and she was talking about how the pandemic has led educators to rethink and transform education. And this builds on you know, what both of you were saying and, and how you shared a bit of how your schools have revisioned in education now, but what practices do you think will continue beyond the pandemic? Who would you like to go first? Jeff, why don't you go first this time? <laughs> Well, I think, I think one thing that immediately jumps out at me in terms of practices that will endure is our use of technology. And not only the fact that the technology is more accessible to our teachers and our students, but it's the way the technology is being deployed in ways that we weren't working towards prior to uh, the COVID-19. And I specifically would say that uh, virtual instruction and being able to provide teaching and learning in, to students who are not in the classroom or physically in the building, I think that has important implications. We know from this experience that some kids have done well in that model and some kids have really struggled, struggled in that model. And for those students that are doing well, there may be the opportunity in the future for us to continue to provide different courses uh, as well as alternative education arrangements for kids that may not be um, responsive to the typical school setting. You know, we have children, for example, who are intimidated by a large school setting, but who have done well in our hybrid because they have, uh, they're not there every day and they're able to engage in learning uh, remotely. And those are the kinds of things that I think we're reflecting on, we're evaluating and saying, how can we utilize what we've learned what we deployed in response to this emergency to enhance educational outcomes for students and to diversify uh, the educational experience for kids and families uh, once we get through this. John, do you wanna build on that? Yeah, uh, I don't have a ton to add, add because he did a great job with that, but yeah, it's really, uh, the technology is probably first on every superintendent's mind that, that has been changed. We were on our way to trying to be one-to-one -one for our students. Uh, and that means every student gets, gets the device. We use Chromebooks here. Uh, and so this, this situation accelerated that obviously, and we had to uh, you know, move that up a lot quicker. So every one of our students has a Chromebook, has access to technology, um, whether they're home or, or you know, in school. And the use of that technology from our faculty and staff and administration has just been phenomenal. Uh, Jeff touched on, on you know, the teaching things. And, and I think, you know, Dr. Cruz is our, uh, you know, Questar Bosi superintendent. So we're with her three, three times a week, at least. She's done a great job guiding uh, the, di the districts through this pandemic. Uh, and she's right. Uh, you know, there are some, gonna be some things that we continue on after this pandemic's over. And, you know, 
Jeff touched on in the last question, actually, besides the specific things like technology, the faculty and staff and administration and the parents, everybody kind of working together and being adaptable and responsive and flexible and willing to try new ideas. Uh, I, I referenced the email I sent on the year anniversary. At the end, I said, we don't really know at this point what the future will hold. But one thing that this last year has shown us is we can handle anything as long as we're doing it together and as long as we're willing to you know, do what's best for kids and best for the families. And that's really what has happened this past year. And so I think that will continue because how you don't go back from something like that. You don't go back from you know, getting through something like this, becoming stronger and better because of it, and then go back to old ways that you know were not responsive sometimes to all the families and kids. So I think that will be the good that comes out of this, that, that people will have a new sense of, you know, we're here for the students and we have to make our decisions in the best interest of those students and their families. Thank you. Certainly, and as we think about, you know, being there for our students and our families, uh, mental health has been a concern um, for all of us, and especially those of us in education. How has your district worked to support students and families and their wellness? I'll, I'll start that one, I guess. Um, that's, that's a great question, and it's, it's probably the hardest thing right now. Um, you know, we have... We have a great social emotional staff here, uh, administrators, we have social workers, we have guidance counselors, school psychologists, um, really, uh, you know, the whole gamut in, in every one of our schools. So, you know, our board of that has been fantastic. Our community has been fantastic uh, supporting all that uh, in good budget times and in tough budget times like we had last year, making sure we're not losing those kinds of social emotional supports. The problem with this situation that we're in is kids are having these issues that never had them before. Uh, and so the numbers are, um, you know, significantly higher for the number of students that are, that are struggling with this situation. And, and Jeff's right. I mean, some students have thrived in it, but I think the majority of students need the social interaction, both with their peers and with adults. Um, and so, the thing we're struggling with is that this mental health situation is again, kids that haven't had it before and maybe not uh, even uh, telling us about it yet. And so one of the things we're talking about for next year, we're hoping that there's some sense of normalcy next September and we can get you know, our students back in a, in a wholesale way. Uh, but to spend some time at the beginning of the year and spend some time throughout the year really trying to reconnect with those students, re-engage with them um, so that we can make sure that we're meeting those needs, again, especially of kids that maybe didn't have any of those issues beforehand. We just came up with an idea and the board approved it last meeting called re-engagement tutors, which are happening right now. So kids that have struggled to log on, kids that have logged on, but look like they're, uh, you know, less than optimally engaging. Um, we have our current teachers and staff are going to get a handful of those kids. So each teacher will have four or five of those kids to try to make a personal connection with to try to re-engage, which is why the name's re-engagement tutors. It's not just about tutoring them and things they might be behind with academically, but getting them to re-engage with school, uh, you know, with the district and, and trying to ease them in uh, to next year. Uh, I think it's gonna go well, it just started, but the, the initial feedback is, is really, really good. So I think that's one of the ways that we're going to address that. Well, I would say that a couple of years ago, we started to talk more so than we had in the past regarding student mental health and also staff mental health. And that has proven to be an important part of our professional development over the last couple of years. And we focused on um, the relationship between uh, how students feel, how they're connecting to school, and what we could be doing both in the classroom and through our social workers and our counselors 
to intervene in situations that would help students remain engaged. That has become really uh, an important priority right now as the number of children that have uh, are presenting some disengagement as well as you know mental health concerns that put them at risk has increased significantly since the impact of COVID-19. So we're doing some similar things that John mentioned. We have home visit protocols where we are our social workers and our administrators, and in some cases, our school resource officers are going out to homes to check on kids. We're emphasizing with our core area teachers, there's a balance. There's a balance between academic accountability, which we all want to make sure that the kids are learning the skills and content that they need, but that has to be balanced in a way that meets children where they're at. And, and for some children, uh, just coming into school and being there is a success. And how can we meet kids where they're at? And how can we help kids who may have um, disengaged during this time period since last spring? How can we help them catch up? Because in some cases, the academic work, the number of uh, assignments and or course credits that they need to uh, make up is overwhelming to them. So how can we scaffold? How can we break that down? How can we maybe show kids uh, and how to, how to tackle this load in, in small chunks and how they can climb out of uh, the hole that they're in and they can see the light at the end of the tunnel. So all of those things are going on right now in East Greenbush, but you know, mental health is an important uh, concern of our Board of Education. We're working on some summer programming that would not only provide uh, opportunities for students who are presenting academic learning gaps, but also to help them transition back to what we hope will be a full school environment in September. How do they adjust to coming off of a very difficult year and how do they take baby steps towards some level of normalcy as we approach September? Thank you for that. So we are getting some questions. Sorry, there was an echo there. Uh, we are some, getting some questions and so I will try to draw those in as well as the questions I have. Uh, but first, superintendents love to talk about finance. So I have a finance question for you, um, which takes us in a different direction, but it's definitely related to the challenges that we face right now. Um, you know, school funding in New York across the nation um, is challenging. How has the pandemic made that even more challenging? Um, you want me to go, Jeff? Yeah, go ahead, John. So last, last year was really tough. Uh, this was about the time where the, the state budget was rolling along. I think we were past our draft one and um, you know the typical budget is the, the executive budget comes out with a certain amount of state aid. Uh, and then the Senate and Assembly do one house budgets and they usually increase it. And then there's some kind of negotiations where we land somewhere in the middle. Right in the middle of that whole process, this happened, which is on that round now. And um, state aid was frozen from the year before. For a district like Troy, that, that kills us. Um, you know, um, every district has it a little different. I mean, for people that are on the outside, uh, who may not know, I mean, districts get their revenues really from two main sources, that's state aid and uh, taxpayers, tax revenues, uh, and, and the tax levy. For small city school districts like Troy, we're, we're over 60% for state aid. You know, some of the wealthier districts, um, you know, in the suburbs, um, you know, that percentage is very, very low. And so when you freeze state aid for a district like ours, that meant Three million dollars that we thought we were getting, we no longer get. And so, you know, our last year's budget situation was really tough. We ended up losing, uh, you know, about 28 staff members. Most of those were teachers. Um, you know, right in the middle of a, a pandemic, um, you know, where people are already stepping up and doing things like we had already talked about from previous questions. So, it, it was really, really difficult. We thought we were on the same trend this year. I mean, Governor Cuomo has been talking about anywhere from 12 to $15 billion hole that the state had to fill. Um, if we were having this meeting, you know, a month and a half or two months ago, we probably would be talking about the same doom and gloom. Um, I'll say that today we are all pretty cautiously optimistic that 
uh, is not going to happen that way. Um, the federal stimulus bill has been passed. Um, not only did that give schools some money, it's also giving um, the, the state uh, and localities some of that money. And so the holes that Dr. Uh, that uh, Governor Cuomo was talking about are, are really going to be filled. Um, and so I think this year will be a good budget year. The thing to be careful of, uh, and I'm sure Jeff will touch on it too, is what they're calling the fiscal cliff. So when you get an influx of money that's temporary money, which is what this federal stimulus money is going to be, and it's going to be significant, but it's going to be temporary. Uh, two years probably, if they say maybe three, I haven't got all the details yet. Um, but you have to plan for when that money's gone, you don't want to be then, you know, laying off everybody that you just hired. So it takes some creativity. It takes some planning ahead to uh, get the right supports. Uh, I did see one of the questions splash up saying uh, the mental health supports that we're talking about, are they going to be sustainable? So the answer is yes, for a couple of years because of this federal stimulus money. But again, that, that's uh, one of the superintendent's jobs with their business officials is make sure you're planning so that when that money goes away, uh, there's still a plan in place to keep the things that are working for students. John did a really nice job of laying out some of the revenue considerations regarding school districts. And as he indicated, there are different types of school districts. This is a good uh, opportunity because you have Troy represented here as a high needs district and East Greenbush is an, considered an average wealth district. And that has an impact on uh, the portions of our budget that are funded through state, uh, state aid. Um, in our district, um, certainly state aid is always an issue, but uh, it's also a primary concern that as we look at relatively low state aid increases that came before the pandemic that we try to do what we can to be as efficient as possible because we have, well, we have a, a fairly stable tax base. We can't overburden our property tax payers with uh, increasing expenses. So um, one of the challenges during COVID-19 has been to articulate to our stakeholders that even though we are operating differently and under a hybrid, our expenses this year have actually gone up dramatically because of the state requirements. So right now East Greenbush has spent about a million and a half dollars just on COVID related expenses. And that includes having to staff the full remote option. So our children and our families are entitled to a full remote option. We've hired additional teachers and teaching assistance to staff that program this year. We don't know what's gonna happen next year, so we have to presume that those staffing positions are still in the budget until we hear whether or not that requirement would be modified. We would anticipate that on a smaller scale, there may be still a, a requirement on schools to op offer that full remote. Additional expenses include uh, the extra disinfecting, cleaning, uh, and staffing necessary at night to make sure that our buildings are well prepared and sanitized for the next day. The purchasing of PPE and other equipment that was essential for uh, meeting the requirements of the reopening plan. So hard sometimes for folks to understand that while our kids aren't coming in in East Greenbush every single day, in-person instruction, our actual expenses associated with operating our schools are actually more this year than they otherwise would be if we had all of our kids coming in and we were in a COVID-19 environment. Thank you. So I'm gonna leave a couple questions together. Um, Kuita Adams is the superintendent in Albany, as you know, and. She was talking about how superintendents have plans to plan to plan, right? You have, you're always planning and, but the pandemic has, you know, obviously changed our ability to plan in many, many different ways. Um, and, and as a leader, how have you adapted to this? And I'm gonna, like I say, bring in two questions. One of our um, listeners was wondering about your connections. Like how have, what resources do you have as superintendent to continually adjust to all these different um, 
uh, changes in the way that education is offered. And then I'm going to connect that also as well to planning for technology and how have you supported your staff to teach with technology and how might that look in the future? So planning, planning for yourself, like what resources do you have and as the guidance keeps changing, but also planning for the future use of technology. And I'll let either of you jump in on those two. Go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Well, I think the first resource we have are our colleagues. And, and John mentioned that Quest Arbosis through Dr. Cruz has been um, an important part of our network to brainstorm. We may, right now we're meeting about three days a week uh, uh, to, and that's 23 component districts of the Quest Arbosis across three counties. And we, we, sometimes we talk about the latest executive order that came down or a new interpretation of a requirement. And how are you handling that over in Troy? How's East Greenbush handling it? And we may not land in the same, on the same decision, but just picking each other's brains and talking through the various aspects uh, help us to better understand and equip our administrative staff our teachers and our support staff about how to go about responding to an issue, whether that be remote, delivering remote learning, uh, responding to some of the mandates for uh, making sure that we have uh, uh, lunch and breakfast for kids who are on remote instruction, uh, making sure that we are similar in the way that we follow some of the New York State Department of Health protocols for uh, symptomatic students, symptomatic staff, and any number of a thousand issues that we have talked about with our colleagues through the Quest Arboses over the last year. Another resource are our state associations. Uh, John and I are both members of the Council of School Superintendents, which has been a resource for us. There's the New York State School Boards Association that provides information for our boards. Uh, we all have private conversations and, and uh, text messages, sometimes into the wee hours of the morning. Uh, to, to trade ideas or to simply have a laugh over the latest thing that came about and how are you handling that? So I think it's trusting and relying on your colleagues and your network that's available to you to admit and acknowledge you don't have all the answers. We've never done this before. And we're all in this together and to share ideas and to support one another. Uh, Jeff did a great job there. I don't have much to add on that. Um, you know, we've always met as a um, BOCES group. Those meetings used to be monthly uh, with a you know, structured agenda of things that we needed to talk about uh, for that month. And like Jeff said, now those are three times a week. Uh, and a lot of times they're just sharing of ideas of uh, how we're handling specific cases. Um, you know, when athletics was approved, that was a big one. Last year, when, when we were trying to figure out how to give graduation to, to seniors who had been through so much last spring. Uh, now we're starting to talk about proms and graduation this year. So, uh, you know, besides all of the mental health and technology and, and learning loss and those kinds of things, you know, we're also talking about the specific ways we're handling things like Jeff just said. We're also both part of the suburban council group. So that, the, that group of superintendents also meets, meets uh, regularly. And so there are a lot of, uh, you know, it's a lonely job at times because you're the you're the decision maker in your district and the buck stops at your desk, but um, you know the superintendency is also uh, very collaborative with other superintendents. So it's it's a it's a great network to be part of and and certainly uh, uh, we share ideas and I get ideas from all of the all of my colleagues. Your second part of your question was uh, planning for technology and I did see that question pop up as well. So. Um, the answer is teachers do not have to, you know, figure that out on their own, at least in Troy. Uh, some, some people, uh, just like in any profession, are better at technology than others. I wouldn't consider myself uh, an expert at it at all, but I have help. I have a great executive assistant who gets me on meetings like this. Um, but we have a director of technology. We have two district technology coaches. Um, who will go into classes at any time to help a teacher who's feeling like they could use some help. We also have um, building level technology leaders, uh, you know, that are full-time teachers, but they get a little extra stipend to 
to act as technology leaders in their district. So there are a lot of resources for our teachers. Again, some of them are experts on their own classroom teachers, but for the ones that aren't um, here at Troy, we have a lot of resources for them to, to learn the craft better. Uh, every summer, and we've just scheduled this, this coming summer in August, we have three days of what we call tech camp, which is three straight days of professional, the professional learning for our teachers that they can go, volunteer to go to. Um, and they're as specific as uh, using Minecraft in a fourth grade math classroom to, you know, things like, you know, how do you use Google Meet and differentiate instruction when kids are in front of you and, and at home. So um, uh, that's, you know, one of the things we do really well here in Troy, I would say is, is support our teachers in their technology uh, needs. Thank you both for that. And as I'm listening, I'm thinking, you know, these ideas of relationship, communication, collaboration, flexibility, just keep coming back in every one of these answers. Um, and connecting to this idea of relationship, someone was wondering, how has parent guardian involvement in the district uh, been affected by the pandemic? Jeff or John, do you want to take that I one? would say that, you know, it's it's remarkably uh, increased. You know, the parent in my situation with a hybrid model currently operating at the elementary school level, our parents have been very resourceful in really being part, more of a partner with their child's education, delivery of their child's education on a daily basis. So the, the level of communication between parents and teachers has increased. Uh, sometimes through emails, uh, we learn about a particular struggle of a kindergartner or a first grader and how we can respond to that. Um, you know, we've encouraged our parents to uh, bring, uh, bring problems to our attention and work with our teachers and our principals directly as much as they can to brainstorm and solve issues, whether that be a connectivity issue where Families live in perhaps a more rural area of our district and don't have the connectivity that they need. We'll, we'll get, we, get, we provide hotspots and devices that help them with that uh, when we know about those situations. So I would say that you know, the direct parent involvement and engagement in supporting the delivery of the, of the learning experiences of the kids has increased dramatically as has these virtual formats such as we're on today en enabled us to continue to have some of the traditional uh, PTO type engagements with our parents and activities that are happening in the schools, but also planned virtually through meetings that we typically would have in the school library or those kinds of settings are now happening through either Facebook Live or Google Meet or Zoom. And in some cases that platform has en enabled more parents who typically could not, you know, get out from either a, a family responsibility or attend a meeting at night to, to jump on a meeting on their computer for a half an hour or 40 minutes and know more about what's going on in the school and participate. So I think that's going back to the earlier question, what's something that might endure that would um, improve education we're doing parent engagement differently and more parents are able to access and be part of the conversation regarding their child's learning through these virtual platforms than perhaps having to meet the expectation with the challenges of raising a family and having to come to the school in the evenings. So I think that has been a real plus. Yeah, uh, Jeff nailed it right on the head as he was talking, I was gonna say, uh, that it goes back to your question of what, what's the good things that are going to stay. And, and Jeff just said it. Um, we have twice a year at, at all of our schools, um, we have report card nights. So instead of just mailing report card homes or sending them home with kids, we actually have the parents come in and pick up the report card and get a chance to meet with the teacher um, at the elementary level. It's, it's done a little bit different like in most schools, but we do that all the way up through the high school level. And like Jeff just mentioned, um, there are a lot of years where parents just can't get here because they have little ones at home or they have other things going on. And now that it's virtual, uh, it's very easy and, and we end up getting more engagement from parents. So uh, everything Jeff said is right and I think it will continue. There's no reason um, that we can't have meetings like this with our parents and community uh, from now on uh, 
for people that can't get to the school. So um, I, I think I think that will be one of the good things that stays. Thank you for that. Well, I have one more question and then we might have another question come in while I'm doing that. So um, first, thank you. We know you're very busy people, so thank you. But my last question is, um, we have many educators who are listening, uh, both current and future teachers and educational leaders. Um, what advice do you have for them? If you were yourself a few years from now, you know, a few years ago when you were starting out, um, what advice do you have for our uh, current and future teachers? Uh, more than a few years ago, but thank you. Uh, it's, it's been fun, so thank you for having me, and, and I know Jeff will feel the same. Um, I, I would say advice to educators is it's the greatest job in the world. Um, you know, there are difficult days and difficult times, um, but when you make that connection with a student, uh, graduation day here at Troy High School, is, is just such a great day. Um, you know, it's uh, so inspiring when these kids go across that stage and they feel such a sense of pride. And as you, you know, see the kids as they're younger and, and now this is my eighth year here. So seeing some of those kids that were elementary kids when, when I started here and now going across that stage, it's, it's, it's such a rewarding job. I meet with the new teachers every summer and I say how hard the job is, you know, uh, the long hours and the, the frustrations, but it's also the most rewarding job that there is. Uh, so you're on the right track. If you can remember one thing as you're making decisions uh, as teachers or as future leaders, if you're going to be educational leaders, is um, you make decisions in the best interest of students. Uh, and if that is always behind what you're doing, uh, especially as a superintendent, I know Jeff would agree with that. Uh, you know, there are times where, you know, the adults are, are fighting change or fighting things for different reasons. Um, if you are consistently making decisions in the best interest of the students and the students' success and well being, then you'll never be wrong. I would say that John's answer was a hard answer to follow because I was going to say many of the things that he already said. Um, you did that to me last question. Yeah, I know. I would uh, I would say that I agree wholeheartedly with John that this is this is probably the most rewarding profession that anyone could uh, possibly consider uh, going into. And you know, over the last several years, prior to the pandemic, we've seen. We've seen a decline in the number of, you know, uh, individuals who choose to major in education uh, or an education-related field uh, at the college level. We've seen declines in our number mm -hmm. of uh, qualified candidates for some types of teaching positions. And so I would encourage people to really consider education as an avenue to really have an impact on, on society, uh, not just on the children, but on the broader goals of society. I also think that one piece of advice I would give is it is challenging and there are difficult times, particularly as you move into various leadership positions, but the rewards are so much greater. Uh, you know, the, the rewards of having the ability to take something that really, even during this pandemic, is uh, fraught with uncertainty, fear, anxiety, worry, uh, and to bring light to it and to bring something good from it is a really rewarding uh, experience. And it's, you know, I've been thinking a lot lately and I, John mentioned the messages that he uh, has given on the anniversary to his staff. Uh, my message is really one about appreciation. During this very difficult COVID-19 experience, I found that as an educator, I am very grateful to have the opportunity to be part of the public schools during this very difficult time and to serve kids and families in ways that are different than what I'm used to, but also to hopefully be a source of support for those around me who are delivering the services directly to the children in terms of our teachers and our support staff. So I think it's a remarkable opportunity for people to re-examine perhaps their priorities and say, you know what, I always wanted to be a teacher. I always wanted to go in education. Somebody planted a seed of doubt in me 
But now this pandemic has helped us all to realize the importance of our public schools. And maybe I'll pursue that. Maybe that's something I would consider doing because I see the impact that the schools are having on kids and families right now and on our society. Well said. Thank you so very much. That's a wonderful way to end with that idea of the hope for our future teachers. Um, Ann Rappaport from the library is gonna help us close. Thank you uh, to Liz, to Denise, and to our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know that we had a lot of people really energized, and I think a lot of people were really interested to hear in everything that was said today. That said, if anyone wants to go back and they want to rewatch this panel, they can do so by coming back to this live stream link, or in a few days, we will have a fully captured version on YouTube for you. So thank you once again for everyone, to everyone for coming, and hopefully we'll see you at our next lecture. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you to Hudson thank Valley, you. and thank you to Elizabeth and Ann and Denise for facilitating this. I appreciate it. Yes, thank and you. thank you to my colleague, John Carmelo. Thank you. <laughs> Any students needing a certificate of attendance can email me, and Ann will put that email on at the end of our time together. Thank you.